Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, yeah. So what I'd like to do to kick off things is to reflect on um, a four-year study of lecture capture that we have done at the University of York. And it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge um, the hard work of um, the uh, lecture capture coordinators at York. So that's James Udale and formerly uh, Matt Cornock as well, who've done most of this research. So I'm reporting on a lot of th their hard work. So what I'm going to offer is a whistle-stop tour, um, of, first of all, of our lecture capture set up at uh, York, just as context, and I'll say a little bit of, about the um, methodology we've used for a service evaluation, and then I'll get straight on to the sort of key findings. And what I'd like to sort of end up with is um, the implications, the consequences of the research. What are we doing differently now, or where do we see the future for lecture capture? Okay, so briefly, in terms of the service uh, overview, um, We've badged um, rather unoriginally uh, uh, our lecture capture services replay, which I know is quite a common sort of term across universities. Um, it has grown in a very organic manner since we first introduced it in 2012. So although there was a bit of a fanfare about us introducing lecture capture, there was no diktat from the, the, the top saying you must use the system. So it's been very much uh, departmentally driven. And um, with, I think, great success because students have pushed this very hard, as I'll go on to explain. And so we've got all departments bar two now uh, that are using it um, intensively. And 60% of our departments, uh, off their own bat, have come up with their own opt-out policies. So that's without the university insisting on uh, all departments doing so. Having said that, we're on the cusp of um, presenting an opt-out institutional policy to uh, our Senate in July, but um, hopefully this won't be a difficult task because um, the reality is already there in terms of the high usage of the system by staff and students. Um, in terms of the, the technology, the, the software that we've used, we started off with the Echo Player and we, we installed it all in-house, sort of hardware, um, software, storage uh, in 2012. Started off small with a sort of pilot move to 40 rooms which were supported for um, uh, scheduled uh, lecture recording and then we moved to a hosted model later on with the University of uh, London Computing Centre and then in 2016 we had a competitive tender we'd reached a point where we, we, we needed to do that and we decided to go with Panopto and that's our current solution now so just a very brief few words about the service what we offer it is scheduled um, timetabled uh, lecture capture so what we do is we get de departments to um, identify the lectures that they want recorded. That, that is done through the timetabling system, Syllabus Plus, and we've built an integration uh, with, our, with Panopto, which then pushes those requests through to our scheduler, and then the recordings are automatically made. So from an academic's perspective, all they have to do is pitch up in, in the, the lecture room, remember to switch on their microphone, which um, sometimes they forget, um, and then it is done automatically for them. That's not to say that there is a personal capture option if they want to pre-record, and they can edit uh, recordings afterwards, so they have that facility if they want to, but if they don't want to think about it very much, then that's all they need to do. So we've, we've now equipped over 200 rooms across campus, so that's virtually all um, our sort of teaching rooms and seminar, large seminar rooms as well, and there are seven rooms currently um, uh, supporting video um, uh, chalkboard capture so that, that's through pressure mats with an academic walking up and down and and then the there's a tracking camera which will focus not on the academic but on the board and I think that's the key thing that uh, what we are recording is screen scrape so what comes out the PC lectern or laptop we are not capturing uh, the academic and the audio feed is solely from the main microphone that the academic is using so we're not picking up student um, contributions either if an academic chooses to, um, for the purposes of the recording, um, to capture a, a question from a student, he or she will repeat it. Uh, so the student's voice is not um, captured at all. So that's the, the basis of the service that we're offering now, and that's run by my team, the learning development team. But it's a, it's a cross-services initiative with timetabling, IT services, and audiovisual. So at the moment, we, we, well, on average, sort of spring, autumn term, we've been recording our about 600 lectures per week, and that averages out at about 6,000 hours of viewing per week. But for the summer term, that has grown exponentially, so um, over 13,000 hours per week uh, at the most yeah, 
intensive times of um, student preparation before exams. The other thing is we do allow we, um, download, students to download these recordings to their personal devices if they so wish. Um, there's only two departments so far, history and sociology, that have, have asked for that to be blocked. But it's a departmental um, decision, not one from the center. Okay, on to the evaluation. And um, this presentation is about the last four years, but we've been evaluating since we started um, through our annual lecture capture surveys. So they've been going on for six years. But for the last four years, we've um, wanted to probe a little bit uh, more deeply into students' intentions for why they see this as, an, um, as, a, as a support for their studies. So we've done that through focus groups. And also, we've, we've got students as volunteers together to um, create diaries, actually reflecting on how they're using lecture capture uh, over the duration of a module as well. So a combination of um, system analytics, survey data, and the more qualitative research as well, with, with these sort of the main areas of investigation, how students have been making use of lecture capture, and what sort of impact this has had on their studies. And that's the range of um, uh, tools that we use, but I think the key thing I'd like to sort of... Um, mention here is the, the partnership that we've had with the University of York Student Union. That's been fundamental in promoting this research and getting students to engage, particularly with the, uh, the, uh, the surveys where we've had over 500 responses and with the um, focus groups as well. Right, on to the key findings. That was the preamble. Let's crack on to the, the key findings. What have we found? Well, we've, we've looked at three things. First of all, the perceived value of lecture capture, how students are using lecture capture, and then discussion on the consequences of those findings for um, uh, learning and teaching support. So the first item, how do they see it? Well, probably unsurprising to you, um, if you've got lecture capture in, in your institution, and most do now, is that students love it. And um, uh, we've had a steady response of 90% plus in surveys saying that this is now an important part of their studies. They see this as a sort of a core resource, and one that is... Um, helping them as a supplement to the, the, the core learning experience, the, the actual uh, physical encounter with, with a lecture in class. So an opportunity for them to go back to review notes. I think that's the sort of the key message, that this is not a substitute for lecture, uh, for lecture attendance, but is a complement to it. But of course, with students, as you can see with the, the quote there, uh, there are always some that um, like to game the system or, or have an easy time. So that's a small minority that um, um, do take advantage. So what are they doing? Um, what we've seen is, in terms of changing learning behavior, um, uh, a more heads-up culture among some students. So instead of frantically sort of heads down taking notes through, through lectures, there is more active listening and with the confidence that they can go back and they can uh, rewind the lectures and they can actually sort of review their notes after the fact. So that actually gives them a, a little bit more security that they can actually listen and contribute more actively in class. The other thing we found is, in terms of their use of uh, lecture recordings, that 59% um, of our survey respondents say that they are actually sort of dipping into the recordings in a strategic way. So they're not watching them end to end, but they're actually using the, sort of the fast speed play to um, move to particular points in the recording after the fact in order to uh, address a particular problematic area or, or theme of the, the lecture they didn't understand. But, I mean, that's, that's a positive thing, but as you'll see there, 41% um, of students are actually watching the whole lecture recording, and um, that is worrisome, um, given the research that uh, has been done previously in other institutions, which has linked this sort of um, coverage of, uh, of, of lecture recordings, um, watching end-to-end -end with low attainment and with connotations of surface-level learning. So we wanted to drill into that a little bit more to find out what the motivations were for students that were watching end-to-end -end recordings. Who, who are these students, first of all? Well, they largely the top five departments um, that um, uh, students that um, identified themselves as, as watching regularly end-to-end -end were all science departments. And in some ways, that's not surprising, um, given that they have been the largest sort of uh, ad adopters of uh, lecture capture, and they have the highest volume of, of lectures. When are they doing this? Um, the vast majority are cramming during revision periods or in preparation for, for assignments. So that's, that, that accounts for the sort of vast bulk of that behavior. But you do get 19% of students actually doing it on the same day of the lecture, seminar, 
or in preparation for the next one. So I think there's some questions arising from this sort of feedback. Going to the sort of the main use case, revision periods, um, why are students actually watching things end to end rather than strategically? That could mean that their original notes are not sufficient or they lack a clear, clear uh, frame of reference to actually sort of guide their, their revision practice. So that could be an academic skills issue. That's something that we need to probe further. The 19% could well be linked to non-attendance, and we mustn't be complacent about this, and this is still um, an issue that skeptics, and there are skeptics within the institution amongst the academic community, raise. You know, why I, I perceive that students are not coming to my uh, lecture, and this is having a negative effect. Uh, we don't have class attendance at the moment, so it's hard for them to sort of come up with definitive figures on this, but, but it is an issue of 19% say that they're actually sort of reviewing and watching end-to-end -end the lecture the, the same day as the actual physical lecture has been delivered. Okay, moving on, the next sort of um, area of research was how are they using lecture capture? And um, I, I was surprised with these results because, you know, we're supposedly dealing with the net generation now that do everything on the go in a spontaneous fashion, but what the survey results are telling us is that 96%, so virtually all of our sort of survey respondents, are watching lecture capture in, a, in what they perceive to be their formal working space, which is their uh, student accommodation or, or, or at home. And they're doing this um, or through desktop viewing, not by actually sort of downloading to um, uh, mobile devices. So although in our survey, half of respondents valued the, the ability to download a recording, uh, only 13% had actually sort of done this on the go. So that suggests that um, in terms of their, their approach to, um, to lecture recording and note taking, it's quite a formal procedure. And as you can see from this quotation here, this particular student is, is um, setting up, um, linking the laptop to the television screen so they can see the recording and then uh, having another screen in parallel where they can actually then do further notation afterwards. But I think it begs a question in terms of um, does this account for all sort of students or in, in terms of uh, a choice over um, the, the formal working space? Or is this simply um, a lack of familiarity with sort of being able to download to mobile devices or indeed to sort of take advantage of some of the sort of the broader sort of facets of the, of the platform? And I think there is a risk that we are making the same mistake as we did with VLE uh, implementation with the digital native um, uh, debate that uh, we assume that students have all these digital skills that they know exactly what they're doing and the, the, they need minimum sort of um, support in order to make sense of the, the, the platforms we're providing them with. And I think that, that's questionable. And particularly this, this comes up very clearly in this quotation from a focus group of a student, you know, a year and a half into their degree, uh, they realized that they could download um, uh, recordings um, uh, to mobile devices and watch them on the go. They've been unfamiliar with that beforehand. And that is in spite of all the um, technical support and guidance we provide them with. So they get a, um, at the start of the academic year, in the first year, um, they get a briefing on what, on how, on what lecture capture um, offers them. Then there are a number of on-demand resources that they can look at at any time on the, the, the student's portal page at York. So videos on how to use the platform documents and study guidance and workflows. But what we're hearing from students is that um, they get this avalanche of information at the beginning of their, their programs and uh, they find that hard to digest. And there seems to be a lack of um, innate sort of curiosity to, um, to, to investigate the, um, the affordances of the, of the technology. So they basically get on with what they understand and use, but they don't go further in terms of taking advantage. So that could relate to, um, I think there's some lessons here in terms of how we support students. Um, there's also an issue about sort of uh, digital skills as well. However, I, don't, I think it's more nuanced than that, and our research shows that. It's not all down to um, lack of awareness or lack of digital skills or sort of confidence in using the platform. I think there, are, there is also some, a level of active disengagement with some of the functionality, and particularly um, the group chats and discussion tools within, um, within the Panopto platform, and we saw the same with Echo as well. Uh, students uh, don't want to be there. And the, the reason for that is that it's not anonymous and that they feel exposed in terms of asking silly questions in a, in a public uh, uh, forum 
uh, where they could be identified and uh, the lack of uh, anonymity is a problem. Equally, um, as we've seen with VLEs as well, that there is a lively informal working space um, already established and that is in Facebook or in other fora where they are much more relaxed in actually asking these questions. So students are going on replay but they're not posing questions, they're, they're, it's basically consuming, look, looking at the video and then moving off it to an informal space to discuss. And I think that raises very interesting questions for vendors and the claims that they present to us when they come on campus say, talking about how their solutions can provide deep, rich sort of analytics for, for us about what our students are doing. That's very difficult to do when students aren't actually um, discussing and being active within that environment. They're doing it elsewhere uh, and there's a lack of visibility. So I think we need to be uh, careful and skeptical um, with the claims that vendors make. Uh, in terms of being able to track sort of peer interaction and come up with rich analytics which will help to inform the way we support um, our students. So what? So taking all of this into account, um, what, what are the steps we're taking at York to sort of um, build on this sort of um, this feedback from students? Well, I think the sort of the biggest message I'd like to share with you today is, or our biggest learning point is the, uh, the disconnect. Um, in the way that we've we presented originally lecture capture to staff and students and actually the reality of where it stands now. So, uh, I mean, the first thing we said to students was this is not a 100% guaranteed service. This is a supplement. The core learning resource is actually turning up in class and uh, or the seminar session. So unless it's distance learning, which is a different thing, a fully online, if, if it's a physical um, teaching experience, that's the experience. It's not 100% guaranteed that uh, the lecture recording will be there for you. Um, the technology can fail. Uh, student perceptions show otherwise, that they, they, they fully expect the recordings to be there, and they are actually uh, been bugging us um, sort of an hour after the lecture has been completed to actually ask for the publication of the recording. So they're very demanding, and they, they expect a gold-plated service. The other disconnect uh, links to staff. Um, we presented lecture capture as, um, as a non-disruptive technology and this was a good way of uh, trying to sort of comfort staff who had um, concern that this would affect the way, the way they teach or, or, or disrupt it or make them feel self-conscious about what they were doing. Through the automated sort of approach, it was meant to be an invisible um, way of um, capturing what they were already doing. They didn't need to change. But, the reality is that um, passive acceptance is not um, the way forward and it will require active sort of academic sort of buy-in to um, lecture capture to really realize the benefits of it as a medium. So what do I mean by that? Well, and this comes again from student feedback that um, first of all, what we've seen in more advanced practice is that staff are now assuming, some staff assuming that students will regularly go back and review recordings. So actually building in rich media links um, in, their, in their PowerPoint slides, which could be links as suggested here to maps, sources from bibliographies, etc. Students see that's a positive thing, um, but what that's doing is upping the ante in terms of the digital skills for academics. And particularly when we're dealing with things like augmented reality and QR codes and embedding of hyperlinks. So this is certainly a challenge in terms of how we encourage um, all staff across a program to be able to, to do that sort of thing if they think it's relevant. The other thing is, is actually sort of thinking about um, how academics steer students in terms of their behavior in class. So in getting them to sort of have a more of a heads up rather than heads down culture getting them to actually reflect in action. So what th this example is, I think, a very interesting one from one academic who's actually said, don't take notes on everything I'm saying. Take notes on the thoughts that come to mind that, you know, stimulated by the discussion we're having in class. So that's a very different approach. And so that's now straying into academic skills territory in terms of how we guide students. So that, that influences the whole note-taking process and, and an extension of this also is that academics should be given clearer steer in terms of what happens uh, in the run-up to revision periods. So the reviewing the lecture recording and effective revision strategies rather than this saturation sort of viewing approach, you know, viewing the whole lecture again from end to end. Um, and with this, I think, um, are links in sort of changes in teaching practice, sort of moving away from the traditional lecture uh, and actually sort of thinking about designing in 
more in-class um, interaction to actually help realize this sort of this reflective behavior that we're talking about. So I'm, I'm not sort of talking here about just flip learning, um, which is sort of a quite extreme way of sort of changing the way you teach, but, but simply sort of thinking about um, short sort of opportunities, brief opportunities within the, the lecture to actually stimulate peer thinking, think pair share protocol, for instance, use of electronic voting systems. That could be one way of doing it. The other way of um, doing it is, is thinking about um, building in um, more engaging class sort of uh, discussion. Um, and as I mentioned at the start, that's not something that will be captured in the recording. So that's part of the value added of actually being there in attendance. So um, thinking about re redesigning sort of teaching practice to maximize the benefits of the physical encounter and also to, to complement the fact that students will be reviewing the, the, the recordings after the lecture, so the note-taking side of it, the knowledge um, displacement, if you like, um, that can take care of itself after the lecture. So this has consequences, certainly um, for the way we support academic staff now. And I think there's a maturation in our sort of adoption of um, uh, lecture capture from simply sort of worrying about the technical side, how it works, how to switch on the microphone, the, how to edit. I think we're, we, we're almost sort of over that hump. Um, and we, we have a whole range of sort of st um, staff briefing um, materials on that. And we also provide physical in, in lecture room um, demos for, for departments as well. So that's all well and good. But I think what we need to move to now in the, sort of the next phase is sort of lecture capture 2.0, um, which is sort of thinking about um, the, the pedagogic join between lecture capture and, and, and pedagogic practice. So just to finish off with, um, in terms of recommendations for the University of York, this is what we've come up with. And I'd be interested to hear how this sort of um, uh, plays out with what you, what's going on in your institutions. But, um, what we've learned is that um, formal induction to lecture capture is needed um, at the point when they're most receptive. That may not be the beginning of the, the start of their academic um, uh, program when they have this avalanche of information that they need to um, absorb. And it's clear from some of the feedback we're getting from students that they, they are not taking this in. So they are not really sort of learning and being able to build that into their academic practice. What we need to do is to um, try and move away from simply providing sort of technical guidance, although that's important to students on how to use Panopto, but actually make a stronger link with study skills. And as we found with, with VLE inductions at, at York, this is best done when it's contextualized within the medium of the discipline that uh, students are studying, rather than just presenting a lecture on how to use Panopto in the abstract that has less resonance than how Panopto um, can add value to the particular discipline that you're studying and, and your approach to um, how you consume and uh, interact with recordings and how this influences your behavior in class. And that leads me on to the, the next point, which is then this sort of change in, the, in, the, in our support regime for academic practice. What we need to, to think about now is, um, and I think we need to explode this myth that uh, lecture capture is, is, a, is a passive medium. It, it is not, um, it, and it will require academics to upskill. Upskill in the technical side, but also upskill in, in, in a pedagogic awareness to think about the, the explicit links between what's happening in class and what's happening out of class after the lecture in terms of active student learning. So that's thinking about uh, different strategies, different ways of presenting resources, and actually using the, in the class in a more dialogical way uh, for reflective learning and peer interaction. And the final uh, challenge for us is then to um, provide good evidence of impact of how this is actually sort of improving the overall the student learning experience, because ultimately that's the challenge and where we've got effective practice to actually feed that into our, our bank of resources for our, our own institutional York pedagogy. So what we're busy trying to do now is sort of develop sort of um, show and tell events and, and case studies around sort of this sort of this more active use of lecture recordings to help sort of um, inform program teams uh, for the future. So that's all I had. Uh, for you today, but hopefully we can have a lively discussion now. So I welcome any questions you have.
Um, well, I'm very fortunate or unfortunate, I'm going through a reorganisation now at the University of York, and part of my remit now is, is actually programme design, pro programme design and learning technology. So it, that gives a wonderful opportunity, a way in to actually sort of talk about pedagogic um, practice with programme teams, and then sort of um, interweave that with um, the, the technology side of things. So it, we've already been doing this with, with some programme teams, but I think that the challenge is not um, to how we mainstream this moving forward, and that, that's going to be sort of trickier to do that. But I think the last point is, is probably more influential there in terms of actually coming up with hard evidence. And we've all been through this with the VLE and with other technologies, um, from sceptical academics, this is all well and good, but show me the evidence or show me the impact on the student learning experience. Why should I be sort of investing in these changes? So it's incumbent upon us to actually sort of come up with more use cases which sort of demonstrate why this is effective. Yes, of course. Thanks. Thanks very much for your question. Um, yes, I mean, f from the start, um, when we were even scoping out our lecture capture service from 2010, it, um, we had a sort of a joint sort of working group of um, IT staff, e-learning staff, uh, working together on this with, with AV. And uh, we, had, in terms of our governance structure, our replay steering group uh, consists of. Um, it's chaired by my team, the e-learning development team, but it has representatives from. Um, uh, IT services, so that involves the um, the uh, the web uh, team there and uh, developers that uh, are part of that. So, I mean, one of the key things we've done with Echo and, and now with Panopto is build this sort of integration between uh, timetabling systems, Syllabus Plus, and and Panopto, uh, and previously Echo. So, having those developers actively there, and, and we, we also have timetabling um, uh, representation as well. Because if that, if that breaks down, then we've got serious problems. So strategically, that, that's really important. So they're part of the government system. The AV side are absolutely fundamental in that um, they, they take care of uh, ensuring that, um, they, well, they're busy with all the classroom refitting now. Um, so the, the hardware, they, they take care of that side of things. And we also share with them the, um, the quality checking as well, which is an interesting sort of um, side of things. Um, because uh, what we try and do on a sort of daily basis and, and weekly basis is to analyze um, statistics on um, how we're doing in terms of reliability of our, of our service as well. So having a close relationship there is absolutely fundamental. Although having said that, students are the best um, early warning system if uh, for some reason a lecture recording hasn't published or uh, they, they, they let us know very, very quickly as well. But, um, uh, so th th I think the answer to your question is we, we have a steering group and that also has student representation on it and our most sort of advanced, um, longest standing uh, academic departments send representatives. We meet on a termly basis and we um, report to our university teaching committee on, um, on the overall running of the service. So it is very much a joint endeavour but um, that is the, your way. We're quite a flat um, uh, organisational culture and we work across different directorates um, quite well in that respect. Um, one, one last question. Uh, yeah. Could you just screen sociology departments give any specific reason why they chose to stop downloads while all the other departments were happy to continue with them? Uh, not to my knowledge, but that doesn't mean they didn't. Uh, they probably uh, notified the uh, lecture capture coordinator. but. Um, uh, I know film, theatre and television um, certainly um, raised issues over intellectual property rights and they, they developed their own sort of films and they were certainly concerned about um, some of their resources um, 
that they were showing in, in, in presentations actually being sort of leaked out, even though this would contravene all uh, computing regulations and if students were found, they would be punished. But um, I think, I guess, and this is just my assumption, that for, certainly for history department, this was a way of getting staff on board to accept this. They felt that their, again, IP uh, rights wouldn't be infringed in any way. Even though, as I've said, um, if students wanted to, 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 to copy this stuff, they wouldn't need to download it anyway. They could set a camera on their own laptop and, and create a, uh, rip it off anyway in that respect. But, so I think it was a way of um, keeping uh, uh, more skeptical staff within the department um, on side with it. No, that, that policy hasn't changed at all. It, basically, we permitted downloads. That, um, the, the central services, we, we don't um, have any influence on that. That's very much a departmental um, decision. And as I mentioned, uh, only two departments, history and sociology, um, have um, prevented downloads. And both of those departments had fierce critics within the depa those departments that um, weren't keen on lecture capture. Um, but there has been no change. So I, I don't know about whether there's a correlation there or not between the two. Thank you.